we we'll just wait for people to come in. Good evening to the to the people who are here already. Uh, anticipation. I should hold the book up. There we are. I've done my homework with the green stickers. Um, that's a few we'll give give everyone a minute. We should have a theme music, Jasper. Sort of ah, you know chariots what? of fire. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, it it uh, better be choral rather than vocal. You don't want to hear me sing. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I bet it would be very musical. Oh, the boss is there. The father. Yes, I can see. Yeah. There we go. We'll give it a minute. People in Ireland are generally late, Jasper, as well. I know myself, I'm late for my own webinars. Um, so uh, so we'll let them have a few minutes. Okay, I think, I think, patience is not my strength tonight. I think we'll go for it. Um, and those who are joining in later can watch on catch up or catch up with the beginning on catch up if they're in late. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to have the honor to welcome Jasper Morris, Master of Wine, um, to our webinar this evening. We're delighted to have the opportunity to speak to him two days before the official launch of the second edition of Inside Burgundy, which is a book which no Burgundy lover should be without. Um, you do need a sort of uh, trolley to pull it behind you, but you know, it's, it's got everything in it. Um, since this edition arrived on my desk, I have been pulled into it. I mean, you know, if the boss is wondering why I start my emails at 9.30, it's because I spend about 45 minutes on this um, every morning. Um, what I love, we're going to go through it with Jasper, but what I love is the fact that the layout is just beautifully sort of, it's very compact. So you have paragraphs that you can dive in and out of. You don't have to read the whole book in one. Um, but I was reading it in bed last night doing my homework and you do have to sort of establish some kind of framework to hold it. Uh, otherwise you get dead arms quite quickly. Um, a little bit of admin before I hand over to Jasper, Jasper to talk about his early life in wine. Um, if you would like to have any, ask any questions, or uh, have any comments, please use the Q&A and we'll try and keep track of it throughout the webinar or we'll answer the others at the end. Um, I won't tell you Jasper's story because that's why he's here. He's about to have a very busy week with the launch of this book on Wednesday. Um, I mean, his experiences are in the book and what I would say is we're not going to go into depth on everything because we'd be here for about 750 pages worth. Um, but we're going to touch on things that are in the book and I would recommend buying the book and then you can get the full story. Um, so Jasper, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm going to pass Very. you the proverbial mic and ask you to fill in the gap since 1981 when you set up Morris and Verdon. Uh, yes, uh, well, thank you. Um, so I'm in, I'm in a hotel room in London uh, today without a copy of uh, the book to keep me uh, company. But uh, my, my story really does begin back then. Um, I left university in 1979, having read what was supposedly modern history, but in fact, I managed to stick in the Middle Ages most of the time. Um, and our family are normally lawyers, but I didn't want to do that. Um, so I was looking around and I got involved in a bit of wine tasting before then. And somebody said there's a wine shop opening up in London. This actually was in 79. So I started um, working in the wine shop. And then in 1981, we began our own company called Morris and Verdin with my um, business partner, Tony Verdin, who then became my brother-in-law. I met him through his daughters, with whom I got absolutely nowhere, but he then married my sister. Um, anyway, uh, so we started out just dealing in French wines and it didn't take long before Burgundy became the main thing. And I was enormously fortunate. I met this extraordinary person called Becky Wasserman, who, who sadly died last month, um, but she became very much my mentor and she was at the forefront in promoting the main bottle Burgundies, because prior to that time, it was just the big houses, many of which are extremely good. So you've got your Bouchard, Paris, uh, Drouin, Jadot, et cetera, some less good. Um, but there were hardly any domain bottle Burgundies being shipped in those days. And this was really the start of the movement. So I was able to get in on that and was able to make something of a reputation because hardly anybody else was doing it. Uh, and Burgundy then sort of took over and increasingly I've um, lived in Burgundy 
uh, got ISO in 1981, and we've just spent increasing amounts of time there since. And then at some point or other, I wanted to try and sort of give something back and codify everything which I've been learning over the years. Um, and so I started writing um, the first edition of my book on Burgundy, inside Burgundy. And I mentioned to my then boss, because I, I sold my company in 2003 to Berry Brothers and Rudd. And I mentioned to Simon Berry that uh, I had was writing, had pretty much written a book on Burgundy. And he said, who's publishing it? And I said, well, I don't know. I haven't thought about that yet because I wanted to write it first. If you go to a publisher, they'll tell you how they want it written. And I wanted to do it my way. So uh, I said, well, I haven't talked to anybody yet. And he said instantly, great man that he is, uh, well, we'll do it. So they created an imprint called Berry Brothers and Rudd Press. And, um, and as it came in 2010, and things do get out of date. I tried to write it in such a way that it wouldn't get out of date too quickly because there are no tasting notes. And it was first and foremost about the vineyards, which don't after all change all that much. Uh, and then secondly, about the producers, because obviously a vineyard is pointless if nobody's making good wine from it. Yeah, because so. I, I have the um, online version of the first edition and, uh, and it's just a brilliant reference point. Um, and you won lots of awards for that first edition, didn't you? Uh, yes, well, we, we got we, uh, the, we got the Andre Simon Prize, which is um, the one which I was uh, really keen on getting, uh, and a few other things came my way too. But that was the main one. Yeah, that's brilliant. And you you touched on um, Becky uh, Bosserman and you know the importance of mentors and how she sort of really helped you uh, in your business and um, dealing with the sort of upper ech echelon, if you like, of Burgundy producers because we know ourselves in uh, in Ireland. You know, we love our our, our the, the burgundy allocations that we get, but going out there and finding the best producers and discovering exciting um, new producers is very difficult. So this book is sort of like a little catalog of what's going on out there, isn't it? Yes, so we've got quite a few hundred producers to, uh, to, to, to play around with. And you can read between the lines. I mean, I'm not the sort of person who says, this guy is making complete filth or, or this person needs to put on a pedestal and, uh, and uh, he's clearly better than everybody else in the universe. Um, that's not my way of doing things, but it's fairly easy to read between the lines and see whether I do care about somebody or don't. I mean, all wine, but Burgundy especially, is about the people. And um, Becky certainly showed me that. And the reason why I got involved in Burgundy in the first place was because having in that year of 1981 toured around all the French vineyard areas at one point or another, and Bordeaux was obviously um, driven more by the commercial aspects. In any case, there was nothing which I could do as a a young and not very well funded uh, um, merchant to to make a difference. Uh, the Loires and the Rhones and Alsace and the other regions um, were more a question of sort of farmers who happened to grow grapes and make wine. And do you like the wine? Yes, no, fine. But in Burgundy, there was a passion about what they did. And they all wanted to take me into the vineyards, tell me how they made it, try this barrel, try that barrel. And it was just a completely different experience. Um, and, uh, and Becky very much has, uh, has led that. And she's always cared about how wine tastes, what it's doing there, uh, who the person is who makes it. And then if you do your job well, then you're going to succeed in business. You'll make some money out of it. But the concept of trading in wine in order to maximize the money was very alien to her nature. Mm. I mean, did you ever imagine in those days that you'd be writing this uh, amazing sort of encyclopedia of Burgundy, if you like? I didn't imagine it was going to get quite as big as it has. And the apologies for those of you who have to try and lift one up. Um, and in fact, we weren't able to do everything. We, I, I wanted to add Beaujolais, but I suddenly got a frantic call um, from our sort of publishing um, uh, colleagues saying, help, 800 pages, which is what the book is, is the absolute maximum. Beyond that, you have to hand bind things. And that starts adding ridiculous amount of uh, cost and time. Um, so we had to pull one or two things uh, uh, out of it, including Beaujolais, sadly. Um, what I love uh, about the book is uh, the maps and your classification system, because you've sort of evolved your own system, if you like, from um, the, the maps from Dr. Jules, Jules Lavelle and Camille Rodier. Sorry about my pronunciation. Uh, so um, and so you reference there sort of their own recommendations or their own thoughts on the quality of the vineyards and your own. So you're not just giving us a map with the vineyard areas and the AOC Premier and Grand Cru, you're 
you're giving us thoughts on where the potential is as well, which is really fascinating. Yes, so um, really, I suppose it was what in in um, UK would have been the Victorian age. It had a similar idea in France that people started trying to build hierarchies and collect as much information as they could. And in Burgundy wine terms, it was this chap, uh, Dr. Laval, in 1855, who really put it together in um, what remains today quite a, a, an interesting book. It hasn't aged too much. And it's the basis of what subsequently became the classifications of village level and premier crew and grand crew do follow on from uh, his classifications. So what I've done in the book is I mentioned obviously what category it's in today, but I mentioned what Dr. Laval said. Camus Radio, basically, uh, he wrote in um, 1920, um, read it, I think, in 1948. But he's basically just taken Laval and updated it. It's not a whole completely new work. But there were already some changes in classifications. And what I've done for myself is I've based it on the premier crews and grand crews and village level. And I've said, yes, it merits that, or it should be more, it should be less, or it's a top example, or push it up into a different category. So, so it's a tweak on the, um, the sort of appellation system, if you like. Yeah, this insight on the sort of generic idea is so much more helpful than just what should be good. Um, it's, that's what I, I mean, you know, I think there's gonna be a race from sort of everyone around to find the next hot thing from your book and go out and uh, go out and buy lots of it. Yes, because I mean, <laughs> one of the things that's happened uh, over the last 15 or 20 years is that top Burgundy has got ludicrously expensive as um, many more people around the world have got interested in Burgundy. I mean, I spent the years from 1981 to about 1995, 2000, desperately trying to get people to drink a bit of Burgundy instead of just Bordeaux. And, uh, and then between 2000 and 2005, the sort of buying and selling, the supply and demand were more or less in balance. And from 2005 onwards, the demand has just been too strong. So the Grand Cru's have just shut off the scale. Um, so what's important and what I've spent a lot more time in this edition of the book is looking all around and going into some of the less famous villages your sort of Montelis and Saramans and Marcinets, um, and indeed down in uh, Macronet, um, and uh, finding out the people who are making first-rate wines in what used to be considered also ran areas, but no longer are because global warming has actually slightly changed the profile of what's making the best wine. Yeah, this is what's interesting, isn't it? You focus a lot more on the Hope Coats because yeah. they uh, obviously are giving us um, cooler expressions and fresher wines now, aren't they? Yes, and I mean, back in the 14th century, which was um, temporarily uh, a warming period, um, the wines from the Oak Coat, particularly the village of Melavoise, sold for as much as Volnay did. Uh, and then when things got cold after that, the Oak Coat disappeared from the scene. And they've been revived really since the 1950s, but it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that suddenly the wines are beginning to become a lot more interesting and they haven't yet changed in price. And nor Chablis is still a very good bet. And uh, you work with three of the absolute top producers in uh, Raveneau in, in completely different styles as well, which yeah. is nice. You've got Raveneau and William Fevre and Louis Michel. Um, and, uh, you know, given the amazing quality of their, their best wines, all their wines, their best wines remain much better value than uh, the Grand Cru's of Cote d'Or. Oh, completely. I mean, I uh, opened a bottle of Louis Michel's Petit Chablis 19 vintage on Friday uh, for one of our Instagram lives, and it was just delicious. You know, he 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 manages to capture that terroir beautifully at a really good price. Um, I saw the video of you with him actually in the, the vineyards. That was really interesting. Yeah. Um, that's on 67 Pall Mall TV, guys, if you uh, want to tune in and watch Jasper in the vineyards in Burgundy. Um, yeah, we also did a, a, a separate one. I don't know if you've seen that yet. It's about the Grand Cru's. When no, I, I walked from the northern end through the seven Grand Cru's, stopping and uh, uh, but I, just as if by chance, I bump into a different um, grower in each of the vineyards. And just by chance, they happen to have a bottle of wine and a corkscrew. And just by <laughs> chance, I happen to have two glasses. So, so we stop and taste them and talk about them. And the first one is um, Didier from William Fevre. In yeah. his bureau. And the last one are the, the new generation of Revenue up in the Blanche. Oh, so brilliant. It was a lovely day wandering through the vineyards. Kept me fit. Yeah. Well, 
Well, next time I wander through the Grand Cru, I'll have to carry a couple of glasses and hope that happens to me. <laughs> um, but what, another, so we'll move on to the history because um, the beginning of your book is all very uh, informative, but it, not in a preachy way or a boring way, in a factual and um, of the moment way. Uh, and we were just talking about the historical context uh, and what interests you in history just before this. And I thought it was quite amusing because you said that, you know, historians might be a little bit taken aback by you've picked out the best bits, but actually, you know, I'm not a historian in any way, shape or form. And I sort of generally with wine books glaze over the history. Uh, I'll catch a few important parts, but I, it doesn't pull me in. But yours is like the sort of, I don't know, the, the soap opera of the history of, <laughs> of Burgundy. So it does pull you in because the chapters are short and concise and they cover different periods. It's really well done. I mean, I hope I covered all the main points that need to be covered, but I went into a little bit more detail where things interested me, like how the tribe of the Burgundes got there in the first place um, and uh, various other things, including uh, we have a few little sort of pullouts on the side, like um, Dr. Jules Guillaume, for example, and it's almost worth buying the book to discover some of the things that he got up to when he wasn't talking about wine. Yeah, I was. I, I'm not going to mention it live on air, <laughs> but it's page 28. Here, I'll give you a quick flash last. Yeah, so the pullouts on the side are, you can see that they um, they just, yeah, you can read a little bit about each person. And if you're very quick, you can probably read that or you press pause, but you have to buy the book. Um, <laughs> but it is, uh, uh, I, I do love that. And, and it just, yeah, it's fun, fantastic. And what, again, you go into um, uh, sort of you talk about terroir and obviously terroir is something that's not scientifically proven, but it is very much evident in in French wines. So will you just briefly tell us about your thoughts on terroir? Yes. One of the problems is that people approach it in a binary way. You know, either you're for it or you're against it. And of course it exists, but it's not the only thing. Uh, and in fact, when you taste uh, a bunch of young wines together, the difference in the winemaking is probably going to show more than differences in the terroirs. Um, if you set up a little grid, which I did once in, in Oregon, you've got three vineyards, each of which has been made by the same three producers. So you've got nine wines in total. And you do a little grid, three across and three down. And it is much, the, the effect of the winemaking is much, much stronger. Um, so that immediately you have an idea of which winemaker is which more than the characteristics of the vineyards. Over time, then the winemaking then tends to fall into the background and the vineyard characteristics come out more. So what terroir means is not just the rock in the soil, it's a bit the topsoil, the rock in the soil, the drainage, the exposure to the sun, um, thickness of the soil, all, all sorts of different things. And it can be influenced by man because, of course, you can change what's going on in the soil. You can do a bit of landscaping, terraforming. Um, but broadly speaking, the origins are at least uh, natural. And the proof of the pudding, I suppose, is that each year in a particular grower's cellar, when you taste the range of wines, each vineyard will come out with its own characteristic each time. Um, and uh, there is one factor which we um, which is a bit different, and that's actually what plant material people have got. If you've got old vines from really good Pinot or Chardonnay plants, that's going to have a difference, and it's not really terroir that um, compared to if you have either young vines or somebody put in the ground the wrong material in the first place. But broadly speaking, what you can't do is you cannot say, okay, we know this bit, this bit of soil in the ground, we know this, this particular type of oolitic limestone, to quote one of the ones, and therefore, we have this very specific flavor in the um, glass. You cannot prove those links, but you can get a general impression for sure. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's so right. I think, um, but climate has a big effect on the terroir, doesn't it? Warmer vintages, it takes longer for the, for, the, for the expression of sight or the expression of the winemaker to come through with warmer vintages when the fruit is forward. Um, well, um, the thing which is interesting me at the moment is that we have ideas about certain um, villages in Burgundy. Let's take Volnay and Pomar. Mm -hmm. And my great favourite for the longest time has been Volnay. And much of the world has been a little bit sniffy about Pomar because the wines have been a bit rough and a bit coarse and a bit tannic, whereas Volnay has been all about elegance. 
Now this is at least partly to do with the amount of water in the soil, which is much more in Pomar than it is in Vendée, which meant that the soils could be a little bit waterlogged. And if you get very waterlogged soils, they actually are pumping uh, the water up into the leaf area, the foliage, which is slightly inhibiting the ripening of the grape itself. And you get these rather awkward, rough tannins. Now, with global warming, these water retaining soils now have exactly the right amount of water in them instead of having too much water. And as a result, the wines of Pomar are just getting better and better and better from, you can see it quite clearly from 2017 onwards, enormously so in 2018. Um, whereas Volme, most of the vineyards are holding their own, but just one or two of them are beginning to dry out. And the early ripening ones uh, are actually delivering less than they did before. So the sweet spots on the, on the, the coat of the Cote de Bonne and the Cote de Nuit um, are not in exactly the same places that they used to be. Yeah, its climate is, uh, is changing massively, as you say, and that's what's fascinating about the second, second edition, um, the sort of insight into where to look and where the next places are coming from. And, um, and I didn't know that about Pomar, and uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, that is I mean, it's a really good insight. Chapter. The climate chapter yeah. they had to rewrite completely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And that's the part that I just find, you know, when you mention with the frost and, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we were talking about frost in Chablis and it wasn't a big problem. Um, you know, I remember walking around the vineyards of the Grand Cru and they pointed at the um, sprinkler system, said, oh, well, we put these in, but we don't really need them. Oh, yes, and you do. <laughs> yeah, and now it's just unbelievable, isn't it, how it's turned, tables have turned. Yeah, they had bad frost in the 50s, they had frost in a bit in the 70s, in 81, then again in 91, and after that, hardly at all. Um, and now they have been um, badly frosted in 2016, 2017, 2019, 2021. Mm. Um, what's happened, and it, it's probably allied to global warming, but basically the jet streams are no longer holding the cold air up by the, the two poles. And instead it is sort of swooping down. And instead of just having the occasional cold night where the temperature goes a bit low, so you might have a little bit of frost, now you're getting these masses of cold air. Um, even in Texas, they had one this spring, and there is, you'll be surprised to hear yeah, a wine industry amazing. in Texas and they lost their vines. Mm -hmm. uh, and then almost all of France, um, really uh, very seriously because most of, most of the types, the techniques for trying to save your uh, vines from a minor frost don't work when it's that cold for that long. But the water one that you were mentioning in Chablis did work. And Chablis is also equipped with um, uh, thermal cables, which can warm up the area. They're really expensive, um, but they do the job. Whereas further south in the vineyards of Cote d'Or, they thought they didn't really have these frost problems. And so they don't have the same ways of saving the crop. Yeah, because I think a lot of um, people presume that, you know, it's very easy in Burgundy, they have these high prices, they produce their wines, they, they then sort of eat the golden egg and, uh, and go on and on and on. But all these domains have huge problems with, um, with uh, yields at the moment, don't they? I mean, the 21 vintage is down to about 20% for some estates. Well, I mean, yeah, the, um, the pessimists are saying the uh, it's no longer glass half full and glass half empty. But it's either, you know, I lost 75% of my crop. And the optimists are saying, I managed to save a quarter of my crop. But yeah. uh, I mean, it, it, for some people, it's going to be as bad as that. Um, they're going to start picking incidentally, um, middle of this week, probably. I shall miss the start yeah. of harvest being uh, here in the UK. Um, yeah. but, uh, the, bit, uh, the big picking will probably start from um, next weekend. And you live all year round now in Burgundy, don't you? So yeah. that, that has given you, because you retired from Berry Brothers in 2017? That's right, I retired from commerce because what I wasn't enjoying was the, the Grand Cru's from Von Romanet would sell pretty expensively from the producer, and then they would pop up in the secondary market with an extra mm. zero on uh, you know, a couple of days later. And it was all about scrabbling for allocations from the growers price and then making a fortune by uh, selling them on the secondary market. And I have no interest in doing that. Um, and at the same time, people in the smaller villages like Sevigny Le Bon, who had suffered from uh, hail problems, really bad ones in 2012, 13, 14, and then frost in 16, um, they were really struggling to be able to raise their prices at all when they desperately needed to. 
So I was not enjoying the commerce bit anymore. And I wanted to um, have a try at uh, uh, a different aspect of wine uh, to give myself time also to do a new edition of the book. And also, if I can give it a quick plug, um, I have my Inside Burgundy uh, website as well, where all the things that goes. They go on that. Yeah, which is which is fantastic. I I uh, uh, subscribe to that, and um, as you say in the book, the tasting notes are all updated on there. So that's why you need to go for tasting notes of bit different vintages from the from the producers. So um, obviously, we're talking about land and the search for land where demand is out out um, outstripping supply. Uh, so the sort of the borders of Burgundy seem to be expanding a little bit, or where you can where you can sort of make reasonable wine from and that's all covered in your book isn't it the sort of yes I mean you know they uh, they aren't making land anymore and the, you know the famous villages everything has been planted up for a long time uh, but some of the uh, villages a little bit outside the most classical areas uh, there they have been able to expand um, and uh, now those areas are often really interesting so well, well worth looking Mm. Um, and then that sort of age old question or the sort of last decades question about premature oxidation uh, and the unsolved mystery element of that. You cover that in your book. Yes, we never quite got to the bottom of the cause. I am more and more convinced, though, that the reason why it happened, it sort of fell off a cliff in 1996 was because of a change in cork production. I mean, there are some other reasons further back, um, which are longer term and which if you've got a good closure, uh, won't actually happen. So uh, it's only the fact that corks have let us down. And even though corks are much better now than they were back in the late 90s, um, the, there is still an issue. And uh, I'm sure quite a few of the white wines that um, you ship will be under the DM sort of composite cork. Yeah, yeah they are. Yeah, absolutely. The problem. Um, yeah. And, uh, and those people who do still use corks are taking a lot more trouble paying more for the corks. Uh, and there are all sorts of other technical things. We won't go into all the detail, which are um, have been tried to improve the situation. But I don't as think you, it's completely gone away. Well, as you point out, you know, everyone sort of talks about the Burgundy being, um, you can appreciate it earlier with climate change. But as you point out, we're appreciating it a little bit too early, perhaps, and the whites especially have longevity, you're paying a lot for a sort of mm. Cordon Charlemagne or a Premier Cru Mercer or something, you want it to be able to have a bit of longevity and sort of evolution in the bottle. I um, couldn't agree with you more because when wines do mature over a longer period, they are incomparably more interesting than when you drink them young. They can still be a lovely experience young, but you gain so much more by keeping them. And something I'm fighting uh, against very much in Burgundy is a tendency by some people to say, oh, well, everybody wants to drink the wines young, so we'll make them so that they can be drunk young. Well, that's fine if it's a Macon Village or something like that. But if it's a Premier Cru Mesa or, or a Grand Cru Corton Charlemagne, uh, you're missing the point. Um, mm. And there are many of us out there who do still want to have glorious bottles of properly mature white Burgundy. Mm problem with that as well is the uh, the lack of supply now isn't it so if you want to do that you need to um, be in there right at the beginning and uh, have a great amount of will willpower to uh, stop yourself yeah. pulling out those bottles early on um, but but done that. I mean it was quite it was sort of I don't know how I was brought up I suppose is that I always bought whatever I wanted from any region very early on and then sat on it uh, and put it out when it's ready because not only in that way do you sort of control what you've got, but you have the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful additional pleasure of knowing that you've got these bottles to come later on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if, for example, one evening you were to, you needed two bottles of a wine that you only have one bottle of, and you'd owned that bottle for 15 years, and you went out and you bought one on the street uh, of the same, it would probably cost you more, but leaving that aside, the sort of personal pleasure of drinking a bottle that you've owned for 15 years is in a different league to something that you've just popped in and bought the day before. Yeah, exactly. That's that's very true. Um, Years of yeah, anticipation. Yeah, this is it. Exactly. It's uh, you're you you are very um, very right there. It's a lovely thing to do and to really appreciate. You know what's what you've saved and what you've managed to put aside for a later date. Um, barrel aging. I loved in the in the chapter on maturation. Um, where you, you, one of your chapters said, um, 
you, you mentioned, you said, I suspect this is too extreme. What matters is if the oak obtrudes at the moment when the wine is ready to drink. Uh, and that was with reference to the fact that some people uh, don't like to have any oak at all and they contrib they call it a fault in a wine, especially young wines. Yeah, I mean, we are um, hearing that a little bit, that you know, if there is uh, an overt taste of oak in a young sample, people uh, ignore that wine saying it's over oak. But it, that's not the point. The point is whether there's any uh, overt taste of of oak or, or too many tannins from the wood when the wine is ready to drink. Um, and yes, we, ha, have you ever heard of a, a wine described as being under oak? Not really. In a tasting note, you've never said this wine would have been better if it had had more new oak in it. But you often hear, and too often, you hear something being called over oak. And I love the expression of a friend of mine who sells barrels uh, into the California wine industry, French bar barrels. And he said, there's no such thing as an over oaked um, uh, wine. There's merely under wined barrels. That I was, yeah, I, t I thought that was lovely. Yeah. yeah. The wine was not uh, strong enough to cope with a little bit of oak. So yeah. it, it is something where the pendulum swings. And there was a period when people were using too much new oak. And uh, for me, I, I don't think you ever need to use 100% new oak. But uh, if you have something like in a good wine from Burgundy, one third new oak, one third one year old, one third older um, then I think that does the job very nicely yeah I mean I had a real eye-opener um, recently when I opened two uh, premier crews from um, Michel Buzur uh, and uh, and so one was Blagny and one was Charme de Sioux uh, mm. uh, obviously both Marceau and it was 2017 vintage so yeah they were too young but you know uh, and what was really interesting was the Blagny was very overt on the oak front. It was definitely really too young. The fruit was hidden, but the Charme de Sioux was all the minerality and salinity and no oak evident at all. And he uses the same amount of oak on both wine. The same, or if he used more, it would be on the uh, Charme. I think the Charme might stay in oak a bit longer. So yeah. Yeah, you've got, this is about sort of <laughs> underwining isn't quite right, but yeah. there is a greater fruit intensity in the Charme, which meant the fruit was on the upper hand and the barrel was underneath. And the plenty it came through, the fruit was a little bit less, particularly in youth, a little bit less potent, uh, and therefore the barrel took the lead. That's it, and it just shows, and that wine will soften, the oak will soften and go more to the background, won't it, in sort of two or three years, oh, absolutely. and it'll be absolutely. delicious. So it is very much a trial and error, taste and uh, taste and taste and decease if, uh, if you think that it's not uh, quite ready and hopefully you've got another bottle in the cupboard which I do so it's okay um, but uh, uh, is a lovely vintage drink I know I know it's young but it's mm -hmm. one where you can be forgiven for drinking young in both colors yeah yeah it is isn't it especially the reds it's just it's a little bit more approachable lighter and sort of Softer? Is it softer, I suppose, is the word? More fragrant? It, I mean, it's not as, as obviously um, sort of hot climate as, as 18, 19, 20, even though 18, 19 and 20 are all more concentrated, will probably all make older bones. But actually, just this last week with a, with a group, we've done a tasting of um, 250 different um, 2017 reds across the week, Premier Cruise and Grand Cruise, and we came back feeling really happy about it. Um, yeah. The wines are accessible, but they have got some depth and they've got aging potential as well. Um, but uh, you, you, you won't be taken out of the shop if you start drinking them early. Don't run out to the, run out to the wine room now and grab one. Uh, it's only Monday. Um, but uh, uh, so, OK, um, what the other last point, because um, I know we've run over time a little bit here, um, is the the other varieties which you reference. Um, mm. And what I found fascinating is that Borgo and Aligote is um, seeing a real sort of um, revival as such, or not revival, but it's having its day, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is an ancient grape, much older than Chardonnay. Uh, and for the longest time, it has made really lean, min, mean, uh, acidic whites which you needed to put some of the uh, creme de cassis to make your uh, uh, kia, white wine kia, um, uh, because it's pretty horrible on its own. Or you could maybe drink it uh, just in the summer, very chilled. Um, but it's really thriving in these warmer times. It's becoming fully ripe, but it means that when some Chardonnays are risking getting above 14 or even in some people's hands above 15 degrees alcohol, 
which I personally I don't want to drink at that level. Um, a fully ripe Eligotte is probably certainly 12 and a half. And it is just as transparent, to use uh, uh, a word that works probably better in French and English, but it, in showing the different terroirs. So now a few people are making some different terroir versions of Eligotte, and you can taste the vineyard differences just as much with Eligotte as you can with Chardonnay. And it's still very cheap. There's a little group called the Eligotte who are, who are making a bit of a song and dance about it. Um, but uh, I, I suspect that's something that uh, may be featuring quite a bit more strongly in your in your offering in the next uh, few years. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I think it's quite fascinating the increasing divide between the speculator and the drinker in Burgundy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, the exciting side, obviously, is the drinking side. Um, yeah. So, well, I'm planning a trip to Burgundy at the end of October, and with all these producers in here, Jasper, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I'm only going for a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I might have to go for a bit longer. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do uh, do come. Um, I think we've covered quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of. Um, of you, you've got some very shy people. No one's. Uh, I have. No, I know no they're all very quiet. Or, or, or anything yeah. else. Yeah. Or we've just covered everything, and you know, they they yeah. don't want to. I think they are quite shy. Yeah, you see, it's your Burgundian excellence, Jasper, that uh, that keeps them them quiet. But it's okay because we can't see you. So if you type out a quick question, it's okay. Uh, I would have thought that Gary would have come come up with a question. Gary normally has some good, strong questions. No pressure, Gary. Uh, um, but uh, but anyway, I'll do a little conclusion while you all think about your questions, guys. Because we might not have. Although Jasper, you're pretty um, sharp on Twitter, aren't you? So. Uh, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, um, what I what I do is work as I put on Instagram, and then they they naturally flow down through either Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, it, so it's you know, life um, with, uh, with with the pictures on Instagram. It it is amazing. I, I don't really understand how to do these things, so I'm perfectly happy to admit it. I cheat completely. I take the yeah. picture. I send the basic instructions of what they're about to a friend in Hong Kong, and overnight she turns them all into the. Right into the yeah. social media because I'm, I'm the wrong generation and uh, don't have enough time free to uh, really to get to grips with it. I was actually, uh, oh, Gary's got his hand up. Uh, I was actually, um, uh, I'll let Gary talk now uh, a minute. Um, no, I'll put Gary on now. Gary, I was hoping you'd talk. What, do, what can we do for you this evening? Well, um, thank you, Jasper, very much. Uh, you know, Putting wine down for me for 10 or 15 years might be great for my children. I'd like to be able to drink it a little earlier uh, because of my great age, you see. And um, so, but I used to have no interest in Burgundy because of the prices. Now you started, um, well, it's a new chapter in my life. I'm going, I've already found two... I'm going to buy two copies, uh, one for my brother-in-law, who is a Burgundy aficionado, uh, knows a lot of this small, small uh, farmers or winemakers by name. Um, and uh, I'm going to start studying Burgundy as well. Will I be able to afford it? Well, I'm not sure. But with the sort of hints you've given us, where to look, the hidden Burgundies, now I think I've got um, a challenge and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you uh, for a smashing presentation. I know well what it's like to be in a hotel room. I spent many of my, of my years in exactly the same position you're in. Harriet, lovely to see you. It's lovely very to difficult you, to talk to Harriet, I want to tell you. But um, <laughs> I'm, hoping, I'm hoping to get a slot soon anyway. <laughs> Thank you I'll so give you a much. call Indeed. tomorrow, Gary. <laughs> Looking you forward to <laughs> your kind words, <laughs> Gary. Um, okay, well, Gary, that's brilliant. And I'm putting three books aside for you, Gary, for Wednesday. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, um, so, Jasper, I'll just uh, sum up a little bit. Um, I love the fact that you mentioned that Berry Brothers uh, created a printing company, especially for you to write your own book. And not everyone can say that that has happened to them. And I don't think that Berry Brothers have looked back since they did that. Um, and they certainly went with this edition. Um, we're all waiting now for 
Beaujolais, Inside Beaujolais by Jasper Morris. Is that the next project? I'm not sure because I did become aware, not only was there not room to put it in into this book, but I also was aware that I don't yet know it in the same way that I know Burgundy further north. So I, I want to make sure <laughs> that I do write about it, that I've got it up, you know, to the same standard. Um, but yes, uh, I am certainly planning to do quite a bit more. There's some great people down there. It's, it's a region that has been totally revived, starting with the very good 2009 vintage, but in particular because lots of new, hungry, younger people have come in quite often from outside the region, uh, and they've really made it much more dynamic. And again, the wines are very affordable. Yeah, I'm really excited by Beaujolais. I have to say, I um, I want to do a bit of adventuring going there. And it's a beautiful region as well, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then um, Volney versus Pomar. Pomar is pummeled Volney then for the climate change sort of revolution. Uh, and that was something that I found fascinating from our talk, that uh, yeah. the water in the soil in Pomar might be its savings grace and its future. And Volney might be um, wilting at the yeah, sides. But not, not all of Volney. Uh, there are just you know a few places that, that I'm a bit less happy with, but most of Volney uh, holds up. Same with Chambon Musny, one or two bits, which uh, are looking uh, a bit less successful in the really hot years, but the great vineyards are fine. Um, Jeffrey Chambotin has gone positively on the Pomar line. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it goes. We've actually had a question on the Q&A, um, which is, uh, about the global warming and whether or not this is uh, going to cause widespread concern and does it impact on land prices. Hasn't yet impacted on land prices at all. They're still ludicrously expensive. Uh, way, way more than, I mean, if somebody bought a little bit of um, Grand Cru Musigny the other day and um, that works out at um, the price they paid translates into 50 million euros a hectare or 20 million an acre. And, you know, at that point, you can start putting down houses and planting vines because vineyard land is a lot more expensive than building land. And that's never happened before. Um, but there is concern um, in so far as that, I, will, I don't want to get too technical, but uh, in these hotter times, some of the uh, rootstocks which were used in the past uh, are fading a bit and uh, mm -hmm. having to look elsewhere. Uh, people are thinking very intelligently and very thoroughly about how they can manage the issue. But we do know that if, uh, if, if we're only at the beginning of the uh, global warming, I mean, there's going to come a time when possibly we'll have a lot more to worry about than whether or not we can drink Burgundy if global warming really takes over. If we do manage to moderate it, then I think Burgundy will be able to cope. Mm. Yeah, as you mentioned, the root stocks, which is another part of your book, uh, the, um, th that takes, you know, that takes a decade to sort of see the effect of the different rootstocks, doesn't it? So you really have to be looking ahead when you're doing your planting. Um, yes, absolutely. It's something that you're expecting to last for 50 to 100 years. Mm, yeah. Um, okay. Well, everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, obviously, the, um, the book will be in Searson's. It is online, available to buy now. Uh, and with, with us through Tyndall Why Much, it's obviously, um, and it will be distributed throughout Ireland. Uh, it, is, it is a fantastic book, and I am not just saying that. I have actually been sucked into it on many occasions, and I will still be reading it tonight, even though I don't have to do my homework anymore. Um, but I have, I'm going to have to have another pillow to sit, sit it on, you know, it'll have its own seat. Um, but, uh, but Jasper, thank you very much. You'll have a busy week. Um, good luck with it. And uh, thanks a million for giving Ireland a little of your time uh, today. Hi, my pleasure. And I'm sorry that it's, it's been a while since I've got to Ireland. And uh, uh, last time I, I flew from England to Ireland, I found myself sitting uh, in the middle of the Ireland cricket team. Uh, so, <laughs> so that, that was, uh, but, that, I adore cricket. That was very exciting for me. Um, so uh, I will hope to come again. And if not, Harriet, I shall look forward to seeing you in Burgundy. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you, everybody who's listening. Good, good night, everyone. Bye bye.